Hi, this is Kelsey Fikowski, and in this video, we are going to study the entire AP Gov curriculum to prepare you for the exam. So let's hop to it in just under 15 minutes. So the exam format here is 55 multiple choice questions. You'll have an hour and 20 minutes, plenty of time. And then you will also have four FRQs in which you'll have 100 minutes to complete four of these FRQs. It's very important, especially with the argumentative essay, that you follow the rubric that will be provided to you. If you're not familiar with the argumentative essay, please search on this channel for a specific video on that, but you should be familiar with whether it's through your textbook or practice in your class with these four types of FRQs, and you'll have 100 minutes and you can work on them in any order, which of course is very nice. So let's get into unit one. There are various theories of democracy, three uh, specifically, that includes pluralism, where you have factions complete, uh, competing equally for one another as espoused by Federalist 10. You also have hyper pluralism, where you have these factions where there's basically too many factions and you have policy gridlock and really nothing gets done. You also have the elite model, and this is sort of a, if you believe that the wealthy and the powerful are controlling the government, you would believe in that theory of democracy. Definitely know those three, and that pluralism is connected to Fed 10. Now, you'll remember that technically the first constitution of the United States is the Articles of Confederation, but that is plagued by a lot of weaknesses. Be familiar. There's no executive branch, no ex uh, national um, court. There is no way to tax at the national level. You can't raise an army, and this comes to a head in Shays' rebellion when the government is unable to put down that rebellion, and the Founding Fathers are going to get together in Philadelphia and scrap this Constitution in favor of the U.S. Constitution that we have. Be familiar with some of the major compromises that we see. For example, the Connecticut Compromise, which is going to merge the New Jersey and Virginia uh, plans together. So we're going to have small states and larger states in terms of population gaining representation. We have that today with the House based on population and the Senate which essentially favors smaller states uh, with each state getting two senators. Also be familiar with re respect to voting requirements. That's going to be left up to the states. Also think about the three-fifths compromise as well. Without three-fifths, it would be very hard to get the South on board in terms of ratification. And really devising the U.S. Constitution is the easy part. The hard part here is getting it ratified. The ratification here is going to require the Bill of Rights because you have the Anti-Federalists who are fearing this national government. Remember, they just came out of the Articles, Articles of Confederation, which gave the states so much power, and they do not want to give up that power. So as a result, they are asking for these guarantees in our first 10 amendments from freedom of press to freedom of religion uh, to be protected against cruel and unusual punishment are all embedded in our Bill of Rights, and that eventually will get this U.S. Constitution signed. Now, in terms of our federalism, um, in terms of the, the types, we have dual, cooperative, and fiscal. Dual is really prior to the 1930s, in which we see the federal and the state governments acting separately. The federal is supreme in its spheres of powers. The state is supreme in its uh, spheres of powers. And then after the 1930s, thanks to the FDR and merging the federal and the state government sort of together with some of the common objectives during the Great Depression, we're going to have cooperative federalism. This will lead into what we call today fiscal federalism with respect to the federal government giving out grants. Be familiar with some of the major grants uh, categories here, such as the categorical grant. This is when the federal government is going to give out money to the states, but there are strings attached. For example, here's highway funding. You can only spend it on highways. Uh, whereas block grants, they can basically spend it however they want. You can basically have a block of marble if you think about it and sculpt it how you want to spend it. And states, of course, love those block grants. So remember, the ongoing theme here is what is the proper balance between the national and state government, and this still continues today. But remember, the 10th Amendment is at the crux of it. So if you're going to look at this, pause it if you'd like, which concept is being represented here? And you should definitely say federalism, 10th Amendment, where states get to make their own choices in terms of when uh, a learner's permit is required by that state. Remember, states have the individual rights here. 
All right, now on to Unit 2, the House versus the Senate, known as, of course, Congress, which together they have mutual powers with respect to declaring war. They have oversight powers and, of course, regulating commerce, among several others. Be familiar with some of those mutual powers, but also know that the House has exclusive powers with respect to, for example, Ways and Means Committee. also has a Rules Committee, whereas the Senate is much more powerful in terms of ratifying treaties as well as confirming judicial nominations. So definitely be aware of that and that not all all congresspersons are created equally. Some are just naturally more powerful because of the committees that they serve on, and thus they are going to receive more campaign donations. Now, when we look at the executive branch, of course, that is the president and knows some of the major powers. So, for example, State of the Union, Commander-in-Chief, and that is a big tug of war, particularly the Commander-in-Chief. And that's where we bring in the War Powers Act uh, in terms of when the Congress has tried to take power back from the executive branch likely would be declared unconstitutional if challenged uh, simply because that is considered in a power in Article 2. But nevertheless, be familiar with some of those powers. Also know that the executive um, has a lot of informal powers. We look to the president for a lot of different roles. So, for example, when after 9-11 uh, you had a terrible time of sorrow, people look to the president as almost like the cheerleader in chief to, in the morale builder. So there's a lot of informal uh, powers, judicial leader in some respects. The president it nominates uh, people to the uh, judicial branch. You also can look at them as the economic leader. So a lot of important informal powers as well as formal power. So definitely be aware of those differences. Also know that the executive branch has grown significantly because of FDR. That is a big game changer in which we're going to see the power and the muscle of the national government and the president grow quite significantly. Now, when we get into Article 3 with the, the judicial branch, Marbury v. Madison is the Supreme Court case to know because it establishes judicial review, which gives it the power to declare any law or act of Congress unconstitutional. That's a huge power. Without this power, the judicial branch would not be very strong at all. Uh, and then the final branch, if you will, the fourth branch, if you will, technically falls under the executive branch, but I do mention it here, uh, is the bureaucracy. They are the action figures of government, right? Congress can pass all the laws that they want, but you need somebody to essentially execute the law. So they are a big part of the executive branch. So be familiar with the various bureaucratic agencies. So for example, a government corporation being, let's say, the post office, uh, independent regulatory agencies, those have a lot of powers. So be familiar with agencies like the FCC, the FAA, the SEC. Those are some of the notable ones because they regulate some sector of the economy. Do know, though, of course, that they do have oversight by Congress as the bureaucracy has what we call dual authority. You have two authorities acting over it. So these are some of the major checks and balances. In many ways, this exam is a checks and balance quiz or test, if you will. So definitely know some of the big ones because you might see that not only on the multiple choice, but especially the FRQs. So here's a quick question. Pause it if you need to do this. Suppose Congress created a bill that the president disagrees with. Which of the following can the president not do? Pause it for a second. And uh, if you said C and D, you were correct. An executive order, by the way, is an informal power, and you cannot override the uh, Congress with an executive order. You could certainly veto it, but you cannot override them. All right, let's head over to Unit 3, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. When we talk about civil liberties, we're talking about the first 10 amendments, liberties guaranteed to all people. But when you have unequal access to those civil liberties, to the First Amendment, let's say, then it becomes a civil rights issue. Sort of think back in the 1950s and the 1960s with black Americans. What's going to be instrumental here is going to be the Equal Protection Clause that is going to lead to significant reforms to equalize conditions in uh, civil liberties. When we talk about due process, this is where we're talking about if you're going to take somebody's rights away, you have to go through a process. Think about the, for example, uh, with if you ever were to get arrested, right? You have a trial, you have the right to an attorney, a speedy trial, open trial. So these are things that are part of due process. Also be aware in Unit 3 with the Voting Rights Act in terms of limiting uh, discrimination, particularly in the South. Uh, also paired with this too is the Civil Rights Act, as well as several significant um, pieces of legislation and uh, the 24th Amendment with respect to eliminating poll taxes. What's also important to note here is selective incorporation, that the Bill of Rights was a really – pertaining originally to just the national government and not the state. So they are going to have to be selectively incorporated amendment or aspect of amendment by amendment. And not all amendments in 
with respect to each aspect have been fully incorporated. So do be aware of that and do know the amendments. I do have a lot of tricks if you look on my channel in terms of learning and understanding and remembering those amendments. And then, of course, the hallmark document here is a letter from a Birmingham jail. This is Spouse's Civil Disobedience by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. going after the white clergy who was you know, basically telling him to remain calm and try to wait this out despite the 300-plus year struggle that black Americans have been fighting to get out of not only slavery but also being uh, segregated and other really egregious civil rights violations. So real quickly, uh, here's a quick, quick question from Unit 3. Which piece of legislation gives females more access to sports, particularly at the college levels, particularly when accepting federal funds? If you were to say Title IX, you are correct. And that, of course, is another part of Unit 3. Let's get into uh, Unit 4 here, political socialization. This is the informal uh, way in which we absorb our political beliefs. And as we get older, we basically become firmer with those beliefs, particularly 20s and 30s. And by the time you hit your 50s, 60s, that's really probably not going to waver all that much. And then in terms of liberal ideology, remember you want more – they tend to like more regulation on the economy, less socially, whereas conservatives like less regulation on the economy and more on social policy. And libertarians really want as little to do with government regulation as possible. Be familiar again with social versus economic policy here, um, especially when it comes to things like Medicare, Medicaid, um, fiscal spending versus monetary spending. Those are very important. And then when we talk about uh, public opinion, that is very important. Polls do serve politicians. They see what's popular, what's not. Uh, keep in mind some of the biases that can come about in the wording of polls, and they can somewhat times be misleading. The big idea here, you really want to see random sampling, and you want to see a margin of error that's really not greater than plus or minus 5% um, because that could really skew a lot of data. Uh, in this unit, you're probably likely to see some type of data analysis um, question, and especially on the quantitative um, in particular as well. All right, so Jacob, a 65-year-old, lives in a rural part of Nevada and owns his own small business. Which voting demographic does he likely belong to? And if you said conservative or Republican, that would be right. Older, rural area, uh, small business owner. Definitely, and not to mention males also tend to lean a little bit more conservative. All right, let's get to our final unit here. Factors influencing turnout, everything from bad weather, the fact that it's on a random Tuesday in November. Um, you have voter apathy, sometimes dealing with voter uh, inefficacy where you do not believe that your vote really matters. Uh, keep in mind that we also have various models of voting behavior. The ones that you should really be aware of is retrospective, where you're looking in the past, like what has this candidate done for me? Has he raised my taxes? Has he lowered them? Or what has this candidate done for me in the future? This is what we'd call prospective uh, voting, where you're looking to the future. All right, And then we have third parties. Um, while they do not play a major role here, um, one of the reasons being is that you have winner-take-all elections. The Electoral College is sort of a disaster for third parties, really no good opportunity uh, for them to participate, ballot access laws. And speaking of the Electoral College as well, remember that's just for – the presidential election, this is an informal type of way to vote for uh, the president. You are actually not directly voting for them. That actually happens in November. Be aware, though, of uh, some of the functions of interest groups where they are what we call policy specialists. They uh, do not field candidates. They endorse candidates, unlike political parties. So be aware of that. In terms of congressional elections, keep in mind that particularly for House elections, um, gerrymandering, which is constitutional with redistricting, uh, you cannot, have, of course, have malapportionment, but do be aware of the incumbency factor that we definitely see here, a little bit to a lesser degree with presidential elections. And then when it comes to campaign finance, you have to know Citizens United. While FICA is going to establish some election laws, Citizens United is going to really overthrow a lot of the BCRA or the McCain-Feingold Act, which is going to lead to unlimited sums of money thanks to the First Amendment and a more conservative court where you're going to have soft money, money not directly given to a candidate. That would have been hard money, soft money uh, given to interest groups, labor unions uh, donating to these super PACs. So that's really going to open up the floodgates. And then you have the media's roles. Biggest one that I would really highlight is the agenda setting effect. They are really setting the agenda. What are we talking? About. How do we know something's going on in Ukraine? Well, the media is reporting it, and that's what we're talking about. Also, goalkeeper, scorekeeper, keep in mind that some of those major ones right there. 
Uh, quick question here. Uh, if a voter went to the polls and voted based on the following thought, Congressman A said he will decrease my taxes, which model of voting is in action? And if you said prospective voting, you would be correct. You're looking to the future. So here are some of our foundational documents here. I do have separate videos on each of these uh, and an overview on all of them should you need to look them up. And then lastly here, these are the SCOTUS cases that you will need to know for SCOTUS uh, FRQ number three. And I do, again, have videos on all of these and how to remember them. Just a quick note here, because of the Dobbs decision in uh, 2022, Roe v. Wade will not appear on that uh, exam. So best of luck. And uh, I wish you the best. And if you need any review videos, feel free to look at my channel. Thank you.